only thing we have to fear is in war. Fear itself. There is no substitute for victory. Let us never negotiate out of fear. We stand undivided, forever united, fighting hand in hand for the liberty we burn, for glory and honor for our sons and daughters. Ever mindful of the lessons we've learned. Let the torch of freedom burn. Welcome to the intersection of faith and politics. This is Wall Builders Live. Thank you for joining us. You can visit online at wallbuilderslive.com and wallbuilders.com. Be sure and visit the Wall Builders Live radio site today because if you're just tuning in and missed yesterday, you missed a fireball. Eleanor McCullen was with us. She won the Supreme Court case that got rid of the buffer zones that were preventing her from uh, being able to minister to folks that were going into an abortion clinic. It's a great victory. I'm here with David Barton. David, I was very excited about her our interview with her so much so she's going to be back with us uh, today for some more. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, and, you know, we talked yesterday, but this Supreme Court decision, this unanimous decision, even from the pro-abortion judges, that is a huge thing. And I think I heard recently that the Obama administration now has lost 13 cases, as is argued, at the Supreme Court, and nine of the cases have been unanimous against the Obama administration. So that's, you know, that that's how radical this is, even too radical for the two appointees it made. But when you're too radical for Ginsburg and, and Breyer and, and those folks, I mean, that that's radical. So yeah. this is a huge victory. And we were talking even with with her yesterday about, you know, this this 35 foot zone, how, how in the world you try to intervene and how successful she is in getting people not to have an abortion, even when she's required to be 35 feet away across the street and they always put abortion clinics in very busy communities and very busy neighborhoods. So, you know, there she is trying to talk to people on the other side of the street with traffic going by and everything else. And yet she's been really effective. And she is just she is just a, a great lady. It was a really fun interview yesterday. And w- and one of the cool things just in talking to her was just her attitude. She was she was optimistic. She she had a you know big picture view. Uh, she was willing to go, you know, back every day. And today, I'm looking forward to kind of asking her, how do you keep your optimism, and, yeah. and what do you do on those days where you, where you don't necessarily get the results you're looking for? I mean, she's just got a great attitude. It's going to be fun to share with our listeners. Yeah, it is, and especially how do you, you keep a good attitude when you're required to be across the street to do all this? Yeah, you know, it, it, yeah. And, and so this this will be a fun day just to hear what she's got. It's going to be good. All right, we're going to pick up with Eleanor McCullen. She's the pro-life activist. I shouldn't even say activist. She's actually just somebody that's out there saving lives. She's just part of that that incredible movement that happens on the street in front of these abortion clinics where babies' lives are literally saved. She's been very, very effective, and she took her case all the way to the Supreme Court to get rid of that buffer zone there in Massachusetts. We got to visit with her a little bit yesterday. We're going to do some more when we come back. Stay with us right here on Wall Builders Live. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Crime is one of America's most serious problems today. Its effects reach not only the direct victims of its violence, but even those who have not been attacked. The concern for crime has not been limited to this century, however. Our founding fathers were also concerned about it. Yet the effects of crime unquestionably were much less in their generation. So what was their deterrent to crime? Signer of the Constitution, James McHenry, answered that question. He explained, The Holy Scriptures can alone secure to society order and peace. In vain, without the Bible, we increase penal laws and draw protections around our institutions. Bibles are strong defenses. Where they abound, men cannot pursue wicked courses. Founding Father James McHenry believed that widely teaching the Bible was the best means to deter crime. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. We're back now here on Wobblers Live with Eleanor McCullen, picking up where we left off yesterday in our interview. And Eleanor, you you yesterday had said uh, you talked about how this was restoring hope for you. These decisions from the Supreme Court that are moving in the in the right direction. And and I just got to tell you that may restore hope for you, but you restore my hope and faith in America. I'm telling you, you you just have you're so exciting to talk to and listen to. I can see why you're so effective with with 
moms and dads that are coming in there. Uh, but I just I share your optimism. These are these are some very very good uh, decisions that we're getting. And if it wasn't for you being willing to go to the Supreme Court, then I mean just think over the next few years the lives that will be saved as a result of you being being willing to take this battle to the Supreme Court because there are like you said hundreds and hundreds of people just like you that do this that this will make them more effective in those 15 states that are that are dealing with it, that that have these buffers and, and that will have to be removed. So it's a, it's a huge impact. But I, I want to back up a little bit here and just ask you, how did you get started doing this? What 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 caused you to begin to minister in this way? Well, it happened about 14 years ago, Rick. I was always uh, pro-life, and sometimes when I give a talk now, I say, how many here are pro-life? And all the hands go up. And I say, well, what are you doing? <laughs> mm. And no hands go up. And Well, that was me. You know, I didn't do anything. I thought, well... But then I guess I'm, I have three children, six grandchildren, and the children grew up. And a priest friend of mine said, Eleanor, I, I think that uh, you should be doing something um, in front of Planned Parenthood, praying in front of Planned Parenthood. This was 14 years ago. I said, really? And he said, yes. And I said, well, all right. So I prayed for six months, which prayer is powerful. I don't even want to make that sound. I just prayed. Prayer is the most important thing that we can do. Our prayers are powerful. That's what I say when people are home, like they're homebound, they can't get out. They say, well, what can I do? Well, you can pray at home. Yeah. Prayer is powerful. So I prayed for six months outside, and then one day one of the counselors was ill, and she said, she called, and she said, would I fill in, which I did. And the first day that I filled in, I was able to talk to a couple and they changed their mind that morning. Wow. The first day you were there. I know. It was like a mir- this whole thing has been a miracle. <laughs> this wow. whole thing. So, yeah, if you can believe it. In fact, the little boy now, what, whatever that would be, they send me little pictures. Oh. Uh, his name is Abraham. And they n- send me pictures of, like, when he's in his little softball uniform. He's 12. And, um, well, I guess he's 13 now. And, um, yeah, the first day. Wow. And, I, and you know how that happened? He, the, the, uh, the wife went inside, the mother, and he came out, and he was putting money in the meter. So I said, uh, you know, oh, you know, I think I could help you. Uh, believe me, this was all new for me. I said, uh, I started with education at that time. And I said, did you know the heart beats at three weeks? And he said, no, I didn't know that. And I said, did you know, do you know what DNA is? No. Well, DNA comes at the moment of conception, and DNA is like the facial structure of the child, the personality of the child. All of that is formed in the moment of conception. And so I'm educating him just with what I knew. And he kept saying, really? He said, I didn't know anything about this. And so I said, well, then go get her out. And he did. <laughs> so I, I, and then I was so surprised, you know, uh, he said, well, here she is. And they went on to have a beautiful little boy, Abraham. And so part of what you do is not only offer help, but if they start to talk, you, um, you can educate. Yeah. That's the thing, Rick. We go to the moon and all that wonderful stuff, but we don't know what happens in our own bodies. Mm. So I educated him. I told him at 10 weeks, the brain waves are functioning. And I said by 10 or 11 weeks, the baby, the fetus right now is forming and all the fetus needs are nutrients. And at 16 weeks, you can tell if it's a boy or girl. I mean, so I painted these pictures of you could tell if it's a son or daughter. And he, he was like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe that I drove her here. Wow. So that was the beginning and then from there You were hooked, I bet, yeah, after that. Well then that was it. I was going to be a counselor. <laughs> but when in my quiet moments I still pray. But yeah, I'm just there to uh offer hope, help and love. That's what I do. And oh, it's beautiful. Um, it's, it's a beautiful. privilege. It's a privilege to be there now. My children are grown and it's I feel it's a privilege. God has chosen me to stand there and to me it's a privilege and i'm uh, planting seeds the other day i was doing i planted seeds of education and help and and someone that said do you think you really did anything because they didn't change their mind at that time and i said well 
our mission is to plant seeds. Where, right. Whoever's listening, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you plant seeds of hope and help and love and joy. You plant those seeds wherever you are, wherever you go. And then that's what our mission is. That's what I feel our mission is. And then the Lord can water those seeds and make Amen. them grow. That, but he does ask us to be witnesses for the truth. He does ask us to plant seeds of love. And after that, then he will take over. But he does require us to step out in faith and to preach truth and to love. I think the magic word is love. Love people. I love people. And he asks us to do that in his name and in his honor. And then he will run with you. If you take that step in faith, it's just amazing how it works. But the Lord will run with you once you take that step in faith. And so that's that's what I feel is it's a it's a mission it's and I love it. Uh, I can tell. I can tell. And and our, <laughs> our listeners I know could tell as well what an encouragement. You're just a a pleasure to even get to talk to, but uh, you're you're I know you're an encouragement to our listeners and going to inspire a lot of people to do the same thing. We got to take a very quick break. Eleanor McCullen with us. Stay with us right here on Wall Brothers Live. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Around 1790, the infamous Thomas Paine wrote his Age of Reason, attacking religion and Christianity. Interestingly, one of the strongest defenders against Paine's attack was Benjamin Franklin. In fact, he stiffly rebuked Paine and told him, He that spits in the wind spits in his own face. Do you imagine any good would be done by this attack against religion? Think how great a portion of mankind consists of youth who have need of the motives of religion to restrain them from vice, to support their virtue. I would advise you not to attempt unchaining the tiger, but to burn this piece before it is seen by any other person. If men are so wicked with religion, what would they be if without it? Benjamin Franklin believed that the practice of religion was one of the greatest assets of American society. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. We're back now with Eleanor McCullen, and we've been talking about the Supreme Court case she just won and uh, just her activism as a pro-life advocate. And, and what a joy it is just to visit with you, Eleanor. You really are. The, you're, you're just a bright light, I'll tell you right now. That's uh, Well, praise the Lord. I appreciate you're a good listener. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to And then just invite everybody to get involved. Um, it doesn't have to be in, in front of an abortion clinic. Uh, we have mothers that knit hats and blankets. I put my brochure in a small little baby hat, very small little pink and blue baby hat. Uh, the hats can just, it just, re- like the mother last week, she said, oh, she said, look at that little hat. And I said, well, you know, so then I can, it just it warms opens their the heart oh, yeah. and realize. Oh, yes. yeah. That's great. So I have mothers that knit blankets. You can pray. You can knit hats. We have a woman, and when we do a baby shower, she wraps all the presents. She's wrapped hundreds of presents, and she they're beautiful. Uh, we have a man that drives a truck. Like, for instance, if a couple have their baby, but then they get an apartment, we would say, oh, that's wonderful. Well, good luck. The point is, how do they move their things into the new apartment? So there's all kinds of ways people can help. This man has a truck, and he picks up the things from the old place, and takes them to the new place. For us, it's easy to say, oh, well, we'll rent a van. But for a lot of couples, it's not that easy. Yeah. So there's a lot of avenues where you can step forward and help the couple and also be the voice of the unborn. I wish that I had a three-hour program because I could I could visit with you for the rest of the afternoon. There is oh, no really? doubt about it. Okay. I got to ask you, though, how, sure. how do you and, – and it's probably what you just said about planting the seeds – on the days where the baby's life is not saved, how do you keep your optimism and, and your hope if you go days and days or a week without yeah. that impact? Because a lot of folks want the overnight solution and, and to change mm-hmm. and win this battle, 
and it's not. It's a, we've been fighting this for decades, and and we're we're actually getting a lot of fruit now of seeds I that were planted we twenty are. years ago. But how do you keep your optimism on a day to day basis when you're out there? That's a very good question because uh, it it is discouraging. You might go two or three weeks and and you get uh, many negatives, but if you feel that you've been brought there and you're and you're and you're walking under the grace of God, somehow He gives you that strength and that courage and he does he says do not get discouraged keep going i know what you're going through i am here i will never leave you i am with you i love you with an everlasting love so i think my spiritual uh intimate relationship with the father son and holy spirit uh just keep me going um however having said that that's true but there's nothing like a, a, a call that i received about three weeks ago uh, well, two calls, actually. One was at 2 o'clock in the morning, and the mother said, come to the hospital. The baby's being born. I want you here. Oh, wow. I know. <laughs> and then, uh, so just like the, the spiritual part is wonderful, but the the, the human part, when uh, she said, come to the hospital, we want you here when the baby's born. And then, I guess now, well, oh, I forget, it could be like eight weeks ago, I got a call. Just you know, you're right, Rick. Because I was this morning, I was discouraged, and I get a call about six in the morning, and it was the father of the baby, and he said, "Eleanor, right before I go to work, I just want to say thank you. We mm. have our little boy now." Oh, oh, that's oh. amazing. So I guess in some ways we all need that little like oh. So as soon as I got that call, well, that was all I needed, and then I. So there's no time when you're working for the Lord. There's no time to get discouraged. We we can't afford that luxury. <laughs> or maybe if I get discouraged for ten minutes, well then, okay. And you know, whatever anybody's doing, it, this is my work. But anything, you can get discouraged for five or ten minutes, or maybe an hour or a day. But you have to go on. Well, persevere. I... You know, I guess that's another good word. Love is a good word, and persevere is a good word. I've never been for cloning, but I would love to clone you. I, yeah. I, I wish we had. I wish we had about five hundred of you in every state. That I, oh, I'm really? so glad I the Lord think... oh, wow. <laughs> seeing you the way that He is. I just oh, that's very kind. What a blessing! You you have been such an encouragement to us. And I know when I get discouraged, I'm going to call you. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. I just if I could spend five minutes on the phone with you, I'll get excited and encouraged <laughs> every day. I can tell right now. <laughs> so. Well, that's good. You do that because you know, and then I'll call you because you remember <laughs> right. Jesus sent out apostles two by two. That's Why right. Why do you think He did that? He did that. <laughs> Yeah, because exactly. one was down saying, what are we doing? And the other one said, let's keep going. And 2,000 years later, we're still going. That's exactly right. You are yeah. such a blessing. Well, God bless you for what you do. Well, what? thank you. Beautiful conversation. You're a wonderful listener. Thank you. And continue blessings upon you and all of your listeners. Well, thank you so much. God bless you. Keep up the great work. And thank you for, for winning this at the Supreme Court for so oh. many others across the country. All right. You're welcome. That was Ms. Eleanor McCullen, back in a moment with David Barton. Have you ever wanted to learn more about the United States Constitution, but just felt like, man, the classes are boring, or it's just that old language from 200 years ago, or I don't know where to start? People want to know, but it gets frustrating because you don't know where to look for truth about the Constitution either. Well, we've got a special program for you available now called Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. And it's actually a teaching done on the Constitution at Independence Hall in the very room where the Constitution was framed. We take you both to Philadelphia, the Cradle of Liberty and Independence Hall, and to the Wall Builders Library, where David Barton brings the history to life to teach the original intent of our founding fathers. We call it the Quick Start Guide to the Constitution because in just a few hours through these videos, you will learn the Citizen's Guide to America's Constitution. You'll learn what you need to do to help save our constitutional republic. It's fun, it's entertaining, and it's going to inspire you to do your part to preserve freedom for future generations. It's called Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. You can find out more information on our website now at wallbuilders.com. Welcome back to Wall Builders Live. We're back with David Barton now. Special thanks to Eleanor McCullen uh, for what she does and for taking that battle to the Supreme Court. 
David, what an encouragement. I'm hanging on to her phone number because when I get down, I'm calling her. <laughs> yeah, she's great. Isn't she? And, you know, it was so cool to hear her say so many things. How cool would it be to get all, all these pictures of, of kids that she saved from abortions? Oh, you know, man. I mean, even 13 years old. And I loved, you know, she, she talked yesterday about how that you've got to love the father and the mother and the child. And how cool it was that she got that guy changed. And then he then went in the abortion clinic and, and brought her out and they didn't have the abortion. And, and, and I mean, that was just the way she, and she did all this from 35 feet away. And, and how about getting the call at, at, at two o'clock in the morning? We want oh, you yeah, to be there when yeah. the baby's born. How yeah. cool is that? I mean, that is cool. And you know, here she is just, I love what she said though. She said, Oh, I was always pro life. I just wasn't doing anything. Mm, yeah. Bingo, man. That's, that's where so many folks are is we are. And, and she was doing something about praying and she was talking about how important that is, but she, Finally, they asked her, well, would you fill in for this counselor? And so now she – and it's completely changed. She's just getting involved that little bit, just changed so much. But I love what she was was saying. You know, we can go to the moon, but we don't even know what happens in our own bodies. And, mm-hmm. and the fact that she was able to educate and say, here's what happens at this week and this week and this week. And, and they were like, really? Wow. And so that education thing is huge. I mean, there's so many good lessons that we can draw from her. Is one is you you may have the right feelings, but you got to do something with them. You may be pro life, but you need to be active. And two is education makes all the difference, which is why we do what we do at Wall Builders and on Wall Builders Live and so many other venues. It's why you do what you do at Patriot Academy. So education is key. But then there, there's something she said that I really want to kind of jump into because it, she said it. In a way that it's kind of like everybody knows this, but I don't think everybody does know it. And she said, you know, I, I'm just there to offer hope and help and love. And she said, you, ju- you just have to plant seeds of hope and help and love. A- and the most significant part of what she said, I think, is plant seeds. And when you're planting seeds, that implies a lot of patience. Because, you know, here I am a cowboy. I go out and plant my hay field this morning. I'm going to go get lunch and come back, and, and I'm going to bale the hay this afternoon. <laughs> no, right. I, no, I don't think it works that way. When you plant a seed, you have to nurture that seed. And, and here's here's the cool part is so many people, you know, they, they say the right thing or they write their congressman or they make a phone call or whatever they do, and then suddenly after doing that, they're really ticked off that they didn't get the results they wanted. And you got to remember that when you plant seeds, that takes a while. It takes nurturing. And so I looked up a couple Bible verses on this when I heard her say that. And Jesus said, thus the saying, one sows, or one plants, and another reaps is true. Now, Jesus said, one sows, and another reaps. So just because you plant the seed doesn't mean you're going to be the one to make the harvest. Doesn't mm-hmm. mean you're going to see the changes. So you got to be really willing to plant seeds and plant ideas and talk to people and work with them. And not necessarily see the results and still not get frustrated over it. You know, if a farmer goes out and, and plants seeds in his field and gets frustrated because they haven't grown that afternoon, he's missed the whole thing. And, and that's part of the process. And the other verse that really stood out with me is First Corinthians in, in chapter 3. Paul is talking about how the, there's all these different folks in the Christian church that are working. He says, and, and after all, what is Apollos and what is Paul? They're only servants through whom you came to believe. And here's what he says. He says, the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But God's been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one plants and the one who waters have one purpose. And they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You're God's field and God's building. And what happens, we get too many who want to plant, water, reap all in the same moment. And that's just not part of, of what's, I mean, that goes against natural law. And so I love what she was saying uh, uh, about the whole aspect of, you know, I'm just there to plant seeds of hope and help and love. And maybe she gets to see a harvest and she's seen some and, and other times she hadn't. And maybe what she's seen the harvest of is something that somebody else planted a seed on before they ever got to that clinic. And so if everybody will recognize that part of, hey, I, I can do something. I may not be the one who gets to reap the harvest, but I can go plant these seeds. I can go educate people on certain things. I can talk to them about certain things. And they may not change right now, but I'm going to plant it. And then God's going to send somebody else along that will water that and nurture it. And then eventually somebody's going to come along and be able to make a harvest out of, out of what we planted. Well, the one who makes the harvest shouldn't be the one getting the credit. 
I mean, it's the one that planted and the one that watered and all the other stuff. And so unless we can look at politics in that same way, we're going to stay a very frustrated people. Man, that's a hard lesson to learn right there, bro. That's, uh, you know, because we think, I know I think, we're, we're both business guys, but I, I think in terms of, of results is, is yep. what we're doing, working and getting the results. And in the spiritual world and in the, in the kingdom mentality, you have to say, hey, if I don't get the results, as long as I'm obedient, as long as I'm doing what God called me to do and I'm planting those seeds— then I should be f- filled with joy, whether I get to see the results or not. That's a hard shift to make that, that mental shift there. Well, and I love what, what 1 Corinthians 3 said, and I'll just read out of verse 8 again. It says, one who plants, one who waters, and they all have one purpose. But each is rewarded according to his own labor. Mm. And if you'll do your part, wh- whatever that part is, if you just get, you get the rewards according to what you've done, not what you harvested, not what you reaped. The, the one who planted, the one who watered, all of those guys, they're going to get rewarded according to their labor and it's kind of like the stuff w- with david in in first samuel 30 when they went after uh w- when the philistines came in and robbed ziklag and took all of his stuff away there were some guys just so tired they had just been off a campaign and they were too tired to be able to go on david said well you guys stay here and you got all the baggage and stuff and the other guys went out and fought got all their possessions back when they came back david said here's the rule Whoever stays and guards the baggage gets a share, even with the spoils of those who went out to fight the war, because they did their part to protect back home. And, and that's the way we've got to look at politics, is we all have a role to play. It may not be on the front lines. We may not be the ones wielding the sword and winning the war. We may be the ones guarding the baggage. But if we do what we're supposed to do, we all get rewarded accordingly. Amen. Good stuff. Just imagine you're in that room when Eleanor says, okay, you're pro-life. What are you doing? Let's yeah. all go do our part. Thanks for listening today to All Boulders Live. Stand on me.